Hey y'all, uh, welcome and thanks for having us. Uh, we're gonna talk today uh, a little bit about how the DoD is using Istio uh, to provide both end-to-end -end encryption as well as uh, authentication. Uh, so I am Zach Butcher, I'm one of the founding engineers at Tetrate. Uh, I'm also a longtime member of the Istio community and uh, one of the Istio steering uh, committee members uh, as well. Awesome. And I'm Jeff McCoy. I'm the CTO for Platform One, uh, a DoD organization. We'll talk about a little more in depth in the next few slides, um, but we're trying to help modernize software in the Department of Defense. Great. So today we're going to talk about a couple different things. So one, we'll do just a little bit of context setting, uh, tell everybody kind of what Platform One is, what the problems they're solving, uh, and how they're going about solving those problems. Uh, some of their use cases around service mesh specifically. Uh, some of the pain uh, that we've gone through kind of on that service mesh journey. Uh, a little bit of practical, oh, and as part of the use cases, we'll actually show you a little bit, I think. Uh, uh, some, uh, we'll actually have a little demo there. Um, we'll talk about some of the pain that, uh, that uh, Jeff and kind of his entire org has experienced uh, as, as they've st kind of started on this mesh journey. Uh, out of that pain, we'll talk about uh, a couple of some advice for, uh, for kind of going down this path yourself. Uh, and finally, we'll mention just very briefly a little bit of upcoming literature uh, as well. Uh, so Jeff, take it, uh, take it away and tell us about uh, Platform One, please. Yeah, so Platform One is, um, I guess in a, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is to, is to find a repeatable pattern um, that's somewhat open source, uh, that's collaborative in nature among the various duty organizations so that we can uh, kind of move the ball forward and how we think about Kubernetes, how we think about uh, it's the cyber stack and all the tools that you get with Kubernetes. Uh, service mesh is one of those components. It is not the only component. Um, service mesh is not a magic eight ball for us. It is one piece of a layered uh, stack of security that we offer um, and that we try to optimize. And, and one of the goals of Platform One is to hopefully uh, over the next year or two is to really push all this back to open source and both the things that we're building as in writing code, greenfield applications, and also just the integrations we're building. Um, we do this. Uh, you, see, you see a few tools listed there like repo one, which is essentially our version of, of GitHub, if you will. It's our open source side on the DoD where we host all of the stuff. These URLs are changing in the next few weeks to dso.mil, but for now they're dsup.io. Um, and, and this is where we put a lot of our um, you know, open source code. We're, we're actually working to mirror this back to GitHub. Um, Source of Truth will still be our GitLab, but it'll allow others to at least have a wider audience to see it. Um, and then with that, we also have the Iron Bank, which is a way for the DOD to, um, to vet, validate, accredit, stamp, sign, and publish images um, in a way that we trust um, using modern tools for scanning, whether that be Twistlock or Anchor or um, you know, OpenSCAP, if that's your fancy, if you care about the STIGs, and, and all these other tools we kind of layer on top of that just to validate the, the state of the images to make sure that they're actually following a trusted baseline and a, a trusted supply chain. So we have a, a binary chain of trust that matters. We use the UBI or scratch or um, distro list images um, as our bases. And then we, we stack on top of those layers and sign those and publish those out for people to consume. And from that, we produce something called Big Bang, which is just a way for us to um, automate the deployments of things like in DSOP here, we list out here that that's things like our chat solution, which right now is Mattermost. We use Jira Confluence, um, GitLab, um, with a lot of the stuff in the GitLab ecosystem, Fortify, Sonar Cube, um, OAuth SAP, a ton of other scanning tools we add to the mix. Uh, Twist like we mentioned earlier, and Anchor, and a few others. And we are continually evolving that pipeline. And, and the whole point of this is for the DevSecOps platform is, is to create a repeatable process for building code um, for weapon systems, both at the unclassified level and at the secret and top secret level, so that the engineers have the same experience, whether they're sitting literally in a coffee shop or if they're sitting inside of, you know, a compartmented secure facility with no windows and, and no cell phones. So, so we want to give a similar experience to engineers uh, across the board, whether they're in that most restrictive working on nuclear weapon systems, or if they're building web apps to show dashboards for, for bosses in the military or, or the department. And so, so really platform one in, in, in a whole is, is a way for the DOD to, to modernize and optimize how we automate DevSecOps using Kubernetes and, and the various cyber tools. Um, that we'll go over in this briefing. Yeah, perfect. And so, yeah, some of the some of the spec, uh, specific technology picks that y'all uh, chosen to build the platform. 
Yeah, so I, I think um, a couple of years ago when we first started talking about doing this in the DOD, someone already gone down this rabbit hole with, uh, you know, Rancher had a really great kind of um, gateway drug into this world for a lot of people who didn't know Kubernetes. Um, mm -hmm. So people who knew automation but didn't know Kubernetes in the DOD went down that that hole. We chose um, on my team to start with upstream. I'm um, using Kubedm, um, and we hit we landed in JWix after a few weeks of learning, um, and that was with Istio and well, JWix is a top secret environment um, that that was out here in Colorado. And um, so we we had to learn a bunch through that. We we did some other we made some of the news. We deployed this to F16s last fall yeah. um, with a yeah. team out of Hill Air Force Base um, using Istio and the same kind of basic stack. Um, and and what it proved for us was and and this needed to be proven this is new this is not news to anyone in, in this conference but it, it proved to the dod stakeholders that you can take the same product the same technology and deploy it in a web app and a skiff on a jet we're preparing to launch satellite with the same technologies um we the youtube was famous we did that recently and and so the dod starting to latch into this concept of uh, what i would call um it's more than infrastructure agnostic it's really more about um platform independence and and so with platform one, we actually don't say, yeah, thou shalt use upstream Kubernetes, or you should use Rancher, or you should use Convoy, or you know, TKG, or OCP, or you pick your poison, right? We say just give us a N minus two compliant cluster. So you know, a Kubernetes 117, 118, something like that cluster. And, and then we will deploy our stack on top of that for you. Um, what's really cool about that though, is we have very different inconsistent environments. So we try to segment those layers so we can move between classified and unclassified easily. And Istio is a, a very solid choice for this there because we had to have a service mesh. We needed to sidecar pattern. We love Envoy. Um, Istio has some growing pains we'll talk about, but um, it made a lot of sense even in the early days after we got through the initial hurdles of, holy crap, there's a lot of YAML to learn, a lot of manifests, and a lot of things going on here. Um, it, we've, we've worked through most of those kinks, we think, now. So we're getting to a repeatable process, finally, with Istio. Yeah, yeah. And so today, a lot of what we're going to spend time talking about are uh, kind of what we just bolded there, right? So uh, the kind of basic uh, encryption and transit, which uh, probably if you're watching Service Mesh Con or watched it previously, you've heard a lot about. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. And then we'll talk kind of about that, that uh, framework for, for securing applications and, and how we're kind of starting to build that. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the first use case, and, and I think uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, this is one of the primary reasons that that I see mesh adoption, right? And uh, it is the encryption and transit, right? Uh, for a variety of regulatory reasons, for a variety of security reasons, this is kind of uh, what I almost call the the standard mesh use case, right? Um, Y'all had kind of some interesting requirements, though, or some kind of interesting snags versus uh, a lot of folks are doing this in the form of a lot of legacy, a lot of off the shelf, and a lot of uh, open source software that y'all were kind of pulling in to use, right? Uh, so I, I know we hit some pain points there that I think we'll talk about in, in depth later. Um, but that was uh, still not not super easy to to kind of get encryption everywhere, correct? Yeah, and it's it's a constant battle. Well, like I, like you said, we'll talk about some more specifics. But the bottom line was the the automation of encryption was super important to us. Um, we have some hard requirements, especially in the classified systems. I mean, if you think about the consequences, if we mess this up, uh, the systems using this are not going to affect your Gmail. It's going to affect national treaties. So we have to be really careful that we, we get this right. Um, so, so things like FIPS validation is becoming more and more important to us, um, which is something we're working through with the different Kubernetes layers right now. We're going to be bringing that to other layers too, including the TLS rotation process. So there's there's all these layers here that we care about, but certainly it's it's not been like easy button everywhere. It's every new tool we bring into the ecosystem is a new challenge for us uh, to to figure out how to make that happy in Istio land when it's complex. Yep, yep. On the flip side, though, uh, the key rotation that, that Istio brings, I think, has has really kind of opened up a lot of doors, right? Because uh, this, I think, the kind of the the kind of encryption and transit that y'all are getting today would not have been achievable with your legacy PKI. Uh, do you think that? Uh, no, totally. Yeah. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I think it's it's really, um, that that's one of the biggest selling points is just um, handling of cert rotation, handling of issuance, handling of revocation, all these things that um, in PKI Island we take for granted. And the DOD is one of the biggest PKI consumers on the planet um, yeah. with, you know, the common access card. Um, it, it, it's how the entire um, 
forces in the, in the U.S. government essentially does their business and authenticates the system. So we're talking about millions and millions of, of active tokens. And, and so it's, it's a massive system. So we, we understand the importance, but, but with that comes a lot of complexity. So the more we can make that more like cattle, um, the better off we are. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, so that was just kind of briefly, and again, we didn't spend a ton of time there on encryption and transit because quite frankly, I think it's, it's not super, super interesting for, for a lot of the folks here at the Service Mesh Con. Um, you know, I will say, I think one of the big things that, that y'all are starting to do and that we would recommend here uh, just to revisit, uh, definitely try to root your Mesh PKI in your existing PKI. That's going to make your, your whole life easier with respect to managing your, the Mesh certificates and, and things like that. Uh, so there's just one, one learning I'll, I'll leave there. Uh, but if we transition over, I want to talk about then kind of the second major use case that y'all embarked on after encryption and transit, right? And that was kind of giving, you know, I'll call it SSO for free, not for free for y'all. Uh, but effectively, how can uh, you make it cheap for teams to onboard and start to secure their applications using the service mesh, right? Yeah, I think that there's there's this really... And, and as I, you know, you know, we've, we've talked about this quite a bit over the past year, but um, one of my first complaints when I first met, uh, met you guys, you and Varen was, hey, I just want automation and how I do SSO. And yes. right now it's not great with this deal because <laughs> yes. it, it, it really wasn't um, like you could, you could do auth in and auth Z, um, right, against JBKS, that kind of stuff. But it, there was no management of the user session. Or it was just you either had a token or you didn't. And if you didn't, you got a big fat four or three and that just wasn't great. Um, yep. So, so getting to the point where we are now SSO for free literally is we want app developers to come in and build their software and not worry about the details. They, they just need to be secure. And we're doing this, not just to the, the unclassified level, but the classified workloads as well work this way. Um, and, and it's just a way to network break using the service mesh, you know, using Envoy's filters, that connection, um, so we can stop traffic flow. And this is super interesting too for, for tools that we don't write and we don't control mm -hmm. that don't have OIDC or SAML or other typical standard um, SSO integrations. We can still protect those as well. And we've done some stuff with Key Cloak to enable our back against those in the same realm so that we can kind of fine grain control off Z who has access to work work workloads, even if the workload itself is ignorant of the R back, it's being enforced upon it. Yeah, yeah, which is super cool. Uh, I actually don't know if I if I realize that y'all are doing Auth Z uh, for for some third party apps with this as well. I know obviously that y'all are doing Auth M. Um, and so uh, the the big way then that that this is achieved is using uh, some some tooling out of the Istio ecosystem, the the Auth service in particular. Uh, and so it acts as a shim between Envoy's uh, and OIDC. Uh, using Envoy's external authorization API. So uh, if, uh, again, I'm, I'm sure that other people will give talks about that today, but Envoy provides exactly like Jeff said, uh, a, a set of filters that, that call this external auth API, uh, this external authorization service, that effectively provide a network stop, right? So they, they give us a handle to be able to insert in arbitrary authorization, uh, authentication or authorization logic, right? Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at some of the config, uh, but in a minute, but auth service, you'll basically have deployed, uh, you mint it out as part of the standard stack that is uh, the platform one deployment, uh, pointed at your existing identity providers. Uh, and then, yeah, like we said earlier, label, uh, label the pod and it goes. Uh, I know there were some enhancements that, that uh, we, I, I say we, I didn't actually uh, make them, uh, but y'all's team made uh, to auth service uh, as well to actually make it fully usable, right, uh, for your use case, correct? Yeah, and there are some, you know, in the ecosystem, you, you see this in all open source projects, there's people running the same problems, right, and the same scenarios, and somebody challenges, they have the same issue, and then somebody comes in and does a pull request, and so on and so forth, and we provided some code. There wasn't much to, to change, really, frankly. It was very, very small. Um, and others have provided code as well. Um, so, so Redis backend was one of the ones that was in works. There's some minor tweaks we, we had there. There was also some issues with just the way that the um, product buffs work um, that was breaking down um, in, instead of Envoy going back to off service and actually crashing off service. So very, very minor things, um, you know, very minor code changes, I should say, the very breaking, breaking problems yeah. for us. Um, yep, yep. And just the transition, which we'll talk about later on, of Envoy as the API changed in Envoy and how we had to change the Envoy filters was pretty, 
pretty painful from SGL 16 to 17. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll definitely dig into that in a second here. Uh, but actually, you can see here on the right side the outcome of that, which is a new and updated Envoy filter config for Istio 1.7. Uh, and this is one of the things that's a little bit painful in, in the migration that we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but effectively, you know, like, like we said before, we have this, this mesh-wide Envoy filter. Notice it's in that Istio system namespace, so it's going to be the default. Uh, if, unless somebody has an, an Envoy filter, you know, more specific than this one, this one applies. Uh, and, and teams deploy, again, with, with that label. In this case, we, uh, the label is protect key cloak. Uh, and what we'll do is exactly what the Envoy filter says. We'll go in there and we'll insert the external auth C for all Envoys that are doing HTTP requests. So you can see we're inserting before the, uh, the Envoy router, uh, which means you know, we, we handle it before HTTP request flow. Uh, and it does the full OIDC flow, right, to, to redirect, uh, force an authentication, and then come back. Uh, and I think we'll even uh, show you, yeah, and, and so, uh, like we said, uh, all service is deployed in the mesh. One of the things I want to talk about, too, uh, that's, that's an important idea is the idea of using the mesh to provide uh, operational assurances. And we'll talk about this kind of at the end very briefly as well. Uh, but, you know, the mesh is providing security between the, the auth service deployed in the mesh and workloads in the mesh, right? Uh, so it's not just, you know, just like the mesh is providing security between random arbitrary services. Uh, effectively, the same security that the mesh offers any arbitrary workload, we can use to secure our auth and auth Z services and gain additional security benefits, uh, those operational assurances that the mesh provides, for our authorization and, and authentication services themselves, right? And so this gives us a powerful set of tools. It's really nice when we get to a system that can kind of model itself, that can represent itself, right? Um, and, and with the service mesh, we can start to do that. And so that's a really, really important idea that I want to call out. Um, and with that, I think we, uh, we, have, we can actually show you uh, how the system actually works. Yeah, let's see if this transition screen sharing stuff actually works without blowing things up. Yeah, it'll be always fun. The wonders of, uh, of conferencing. Hey, hey it worked. did it work? Yeah, I think it did. It's exciting. So, so <laughs> inside of uh, Platform One, we have this, um, this sort of concept of stamping we're trying to do right now called Hello World, which is just like examples, distilled down examples of how to use uh, parts of our Big Bang product. Um, and this is the first one we did um, that I've spent a lot of time on myself um, directly just because I wanted to get it right because I've been stuck in the Istio Ozzy lay in for a little bit. <laughs> um, but, but basically, we had this simple little script. It uses Cert Manager, it uses K3D, um, the Istio CLI, um, and I'm sorry, make Cert, not Cert Manager, to generate basically a, a, a simple little Hello World concept for you. Um, so I will go ahead and kick that off. Um, this is actually already running, but I'm going to kill it by running the same script. It'll destroy the cluster and recreate it. And if you haven't used K3D, it's um, it's similar to kind, but um, we have quite a few rancher people on our team and, and they have convinced me to love K3D because um, it's just really dang fast, as you can see. Um, and so it works really well, but kind is also perfectly valid here. We just happen to use K3D a lot of platform one. No hating at all against kind because we also love it. Um, little head against but Minikube, that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so what's happening here is, great. is, yes, <laughs> but delete, create, cluster, all basic stuff. You guys all know this stuff. Um, and then Istio is going to do its thing. As a reminder, nothing fancy here. We're just creating a basic cluster with some AD443 load balancers and installing some certs that we generated that I, my browser will not trust because we're using make cert to install them um, and, and go from there um, and deploy them out. So um, with this setup here, and it should be just about done now, what we try to do is kind of distill down like what's what. So hello world, we wanted to show you how simple it was. And really, this is all it is. So pod info, if you don't know, is a super great tool. Uh, open source tool that just shows you a bunch of great stuff about a pod running into your cluster. So you can use headers, environment variables, and do some tests against it. There's a whole Swagger API you can check out. But we wanted to show if you took some random workload, in this case, pod info, and then protected it, what would it take? Um, and we use customize to do patching. So if you're not familiar, you know, it's pretty basic. Pull on a remote resource and add this patch to merge here, which is going to now do the enforcement for us. Um, and then the config for auth service, which is Frankly, a little verbose right now. We don't super love this still. There's still some work to be done here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we defined out we're tracing right now, so super high, <laughs> highly verbose right now, <laughs> just against localhost. And 
Um, yes, this is a client ID that's publicly available, but it's only valid against localhost. Hence the, this is not a real secret, bro, so don't freak out. Uh, we pass in both a bearer authorization, which is what you need if you're doing auth in, auth Z type stuff uh, with the service mesh beyond the X auth Z um, service. Mm -hmm. um, we don't anymore. We've actually removed all that. We've got to remove all that code. We used to actually create those filters. App developers can still do that if they want to, but they don't need to anymore. So if you wanted to do further filtering, um, some sort of auth Z thing against a claim on the jot, you could do that, but we just, we don't require that uh, for our engineers. Literally, they just say, go read the header. JWT, and there's your token, parse it out. Um, we've given an example of what that looks like from our SSO, some basic information, um, what it would look like to them. So they can see the format and they go from there. Right, so this is booted now. Um, and we can see these labels exist here for protect the key cloak as expected. So I'm gonna go over here um, to Google and I'm currently logged into a session or hopefully I still am. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to localhost uh, with this network traffic logging. So you can see this. All right, so you can see what happened here. I don't wanna show you my tokens, but but basically we were at localhost. It redirected to our our production SSO. We do that on purpose. We want the engineers to be able to see it live with their real credentials. So they can actually see their headers and see their claims. And because I'm already in an authenticated session, I know that basically KeyClick has a running session right now. It's active still. We were redirected and now we're back here. Now to show you a, Another example here, we're not going to, we went back and forth on how to show this without exposing too much about credentials or you know how we do this stuff. So we're just going to let it redirect to a login, basically. As you can see here, it redirected to a login screen as expected. And now you're at our little baby Yoda login screen. Um, and, and just GWiz facts, what we do key cloak. There's a whole bunch of extra stuff we're doing here. We built a whole custom framework around this so that we can do the RBAC and auth C stuff at mm -hmm. KeyCloak before it even touches the workloads, before it even touches the OIDC consumer. So, so we actually do some ad interesting checks. Um, even beyond this, we actually have AppGate for authentication. So we do a bunch of layers above just this, but at the very basic level, who you are at an OIDC provider trying to get authenticated, trying to follow the OIDC OAuth 2 flow. Um, we're stopping you here, obviously, because we don't want to show any more about how we do the DOD side. It's, you can go look it up. It's very basic. It's all the same auth flows. We also do do um, PKI here, um, but because my smart card is removed, it's not prompting, but um, this would flow to pod info and then you would see it. And that's kind of the, the, the workflow through there. I'm gonna switch back over to you now, Zach. Yeah, thanks. Uh, awesome, and so that is, and there obviously, uh, pod info is uh, a wonderful example of a third party uh, application. Uh, as well that we are that we're able to, uh, to to provide authentication and authorization over right uh, and so with that then we want to pivot a little bit which is uh, you know and so that is I just want to call out incredibly cool right the fact that we can have SSO against production uh, identity servers for any single application adding a label that is uh, is awesome and a huge time saving as well for a lot of your developers because historically if, if they had wanted to do this, they basically would have had to maintain this entire infrastructure themselves, correct? Uh, not the identity servers, but the, the they would have had to handle calling the yeah. OIDC, the, the whole flow, right? And I would say just one other thing on that. So we've, we've gone, we've iterated on this a whole bunch. We've gone through dozens of iterations on this concept at Platform One um, with many different systems and some of the most significant systems in the DOD and some very basic things and everything in between. And um, what initially we, you know, we had apps going and building their own SSO, <laughs> building their own SSO, literally creating a key cloak or using some other third party SSO, the Air Force has some that they provide you uh, as well, using those and consuming those and then writing like these authentication brokers um, to go to their applications, very complex, very uh, risky. Um, and then we had others who would, okay, fine, we'll use this SSO OIDC or SAML, excuse me, and then you know we'll we'll consume it some way through the application and manage state there. Um, so all these different variances. Then we finally got to the point where with OS service and before that a few other similar tools we used um, using envoy filters that were really complex. The envoy filters were getting really messy, very big, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of stuff going on. It took a dang degree to read through those. That was complicated, yeah. but then it was worse than that because you also had to deploy as a sidecar OS service attached to the workloads. So you're not just deploying this, you know, Envoy filter configuration and it's often an OSC filters in Istio, you're then also deploying this, this other sidecar thing. Oh, by the way, if you have 
you know, more than one replica running, which is like what pretty much anyone does in these systems, you now have multiple sidecars, right, for each of those different workloads, so there's different replicas, and now your state isn't synchronized, so you have to do things like a backend Redis to manage state. So now you have this really complex thing, it was so complex that we actually used cookie cutter to try to automate the deployment of all those manifests, because it was a lot of manifests, yep. a lot of state to manage. For engineers who don't even barely know Kubernetes, we're now yep, expected yep. to manage all this complexity. So we've we've now broken it back down to literally add a label to whatever workload you want that will now be protected. Yep, which is, yeah, just awesome. Um, however, there was a lot of pain to get there. Uh, and, and, you know, we've kind of alluded to it throughout, right? But uh, I think it's worthwhile for us to kind of call out uh, and call attention to I, I what I think are some pretty important areas uh, that need to be improved, right? And I think... Uh, you know, Jeff maybe can, can scream this one, but uh, maybe the single biggest area that is still rough today is, is upgrades. Uh, upgrades are still really painful. Uh, I think they're a lot better than they have been historically. Uh, you know, I think, uh, and maybe Jeff, I don't know if you want to confirm, like, kind of some of the earlier days versus now. Um, you know, Bad today, memories. for example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, so today, for example, there is an API now. That's phenomenal. You know, having an API for upgrade is, is such a uh, big improvement over before. Unfortunately, the discoverability of that API is really bad. Um, and, and that ca has caused us quite a bit of pain, right? In particular, for example, there's a whole lot of values that used to exist in the Istio Helm charts that you would then set in the value stanza of the Istio operator API. And it was basically the escape patch, right? Uh, and so for that reason, it was not very well documented what even the values that you can set are. So then to kind of compound that, uh, a lot of those values over time have been updated and upgraded into first class fields on the operator API itself, which is phenomenal. That's great, right? That's exactly what we want to see. The problem is uh, there tends to be kind of lackluster documentation when that happens, right? And so there's not a very good guide for how you might keep your operator API, your operator CR, uh, up to date over ver different versions of Istio. So I think that's one of the kind of big areas that, that could use quite a bit of improvement today. Um, yeah, Jeff, I don't know if you want to uh, add color yeah, there other than just, just weeping like, and gnashing of Generally team. speaking, yeah, from a consumer's perspective, um, you know, we Platform One, we are, we are definitely probably third graders in Istio land still. I mean, that's why we brought in Tetrate to help us you know, when we get stuck. And uh, <laughs> I'll mention envoy filters. I, I had Zach read line by line with me the envelope filters to explain to me what's happening and, and why. Um, but there's been just lots of gotchas throughout the um, the past year, year and a, I guess almost two years now of doing Istio stuff. And um, you know, just from a consumer perspective, it's it's so much better. We were so excited about 1.5. We jumped on 1.5 immediately. Yep. <laughs> and that had consequences <laughs> uh, in 1.6 <laughs> land. We basically had to skip 1.6 because we had perpetual issues, uh, but we're finally migrating our workloads from 1.5 to 1.7. and um, getting better, you know, every day, but it, it definitely is. It's been a very, very frustrating me screaming at Istio ride in our team saying, why are we been doing this a lot? But we're starting to finally see the, the fruition of that work and the stability in the APIs and, and it's, it's come a long way. Nice. Awesome. I'm glad to hear. Um, and then, you know, kind of to, to carry on in that same vein, right? Um, there, I, you know, I just complained about the operator docs. There, the other docs in general need some improvements. I think uh, we talked about that Envoy filter specifically, so we'll, we'll revisit that one now. Um, the syntax on the Envoy filter changed uh, going from Istio 1.6 to 1.7. Now, there was actually nice documentation going over that change. Yep. Uh, if you went and read the, the detailed upgrade notes for, for Istio 1.7. Uh, unfortunately, the the underlying documentation under that we you know so hey envoy filter told yeah you know, we know hey the syntax changed that's great uh, unfortunately you know it, that syntax change included adding some things like this at type field uh, and so one of the yeah. great mysteries is what do I put in the at type field right and so there are, there are still some yeah. some holes in the documentation today you know this is another example where I think Istio is getting a lot better right the fact that we had those detailed notes in the 1.7 upgrade that talked about the, the change of the shape of the Envoy filter API, that's great, right? We haven't had that, that level of detail before. Unfortunately, there's so little of a gap that we need to cover, I think, in terms of really making them uh, very usable and easy to use. 
Yeah, I think one of the things we ran into is just kind of weird that I still don't fully understand, even looking back at it, was we had to actually change the envelope filter gRPC or the that we were you know yeah yep, we we're yep. using or, or the stances we we're using because it like the the envoy one was not working <laughs> at yes. all but the google one worked and it's completely yes. different syntax like it's totally different syntax um yeah but and so this code is base but <laughs> yep 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 and so this is another kind of key problem in envoy filter this is maybe a problem unique to the envoy filter because it's that break class between envoy and istio uh but we had kind of the double whammy of not just head uh, Istio 1.0, you know, going from 1.5 to 1.7 changed the Envoy filter. But in fact, uh, the actual underlying Envoy configuration itself uh, also changed, right? And so, right. and so we had this double change that we had to figure out. Uh, like Jeff said, there's a change in how the gRPC configuration works inside of Envoy too. Uh, and so that kind of double whammy, again, really just goes to that kind of, that lack of some of that second layer documentation, right? Uh, uh, which, you know, an Envoy filter case might be a little hard to provide, but it's really needed for that usability. Um, you know, Jeff, I'm sure you have a lot, a lot of stuff to say here, right? But uh, mm. it, maybe the, the short summary is, it's still pretty challenging to roll out a CO to a large team, yeah? Yeah, I mean, all the love for Istio team, it's, it's, it's definitely better, but there's, uh, there's, there's challenges, um, especially when, in the DoD's case, we just lack um, we lack Kubernetes expertise in the department overall. So it's it's contracted in, right? And and the contracting quality is is extraordinarily varied. Uh, so I I have met few, if any, in anyone's team in any service in the military that I walked away and I said, "Wow, they really get service mesh." It's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. I haven't found it. Um, at all and so it, it's hard and then specifically Istio um, we've come a long way in trying to simplify that stuff but there's always these crazy weird gotchas whether it's the gateways of our service definitions you mentioned here or it's service entries or some egress gateway ism we run into and there, there's always something new yep. <laughs> some new pain yep. we find um, but we're also perpetually evolving the complexity of our stack too we're, we're deploying both all these DSOP things, which is, you know, your collaboration tools, developer tools, developer environments. Um, but then we're also deploying all these very custom specialized workloads, um, some of them for embedded systems uh, and the weapon systems. And so it's a completely different ecosystem and um, soon will be real-time operating system workloads as well for, you know, for aircraft. So there's all these really complex things happening under the hood that having something like Istio is, both wonderfully powerful for the security and the flexibility you get from it, but incredibly frustrating when you're trying to, to do deep debugging. And so like Istio CTL analyze is, is a, one of my new best friends um, for Istio isms. <laughs> yep, <laughs> um, when yep. I don't understand something, it definitely does a pretty decent job of helping me understand what's happening. Um, so the, I think it's one of the most valuable things the ecosystems introduced recently is the CLI um, and actually mm -hmm. making it truly useful for us to help troubleshoot. Yeah, yeah, I'll just echo that and say that uh, I think the Istio control work uh, across a bunch of the different commands uh, there, and a lot of that's come out of the, the uh, Istio user experience working group. Uh, Y'all are doing a great job, right? I think that, that if yeah. I were going to call out kind of one of, the, one of the best areas, in my opinion, of the project today, uh, I think, I think y'all are doing great stuff. Uh, and, and really, sure. a lot of the tooling has come a, come a really, really long way. There's still a lot more to go. Uh, right, even catching little errors. I, I have up an example here, right? Uh, Jeff and, and the team had changed some gateway ports, right? And, and another group had had a virtual service that matched on port number. Uh, you know, that seems, you know, innocent enough until you're trying to figure out why traffic doesn't flow for, for one group across, you know, 20 different yeah. YAMLs. And you just don't see that, oh, this, this 443 needs to be an 8443, right? Uh, and you know, in little things and bonus like that. points, it's using Argo to pull it in. So they're not even like all in one spot unless you go look at the cluster itself to see it all. Cause you won't see exactly. it all in one spot. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so that's some areas where I think things like, uh, you know, Istio control analyze, uh, still has room to grow, right? There's already yeah. pretty promising work there to, to begin. Uh, and it, it's already super helpful. I think as we get more mature, we can we can start to stamp out a lot more of those kind of small, uh, you know, gotcha misconfigs, right? Which at least in my experience are the vast majority of kind of the, the angst of Istio config debugging. Oh yeah, for sure. It's always just little things. Yep. 
Uh, and then, you know, finally, and, and we'll go pretty fast here because we're, we're nearly out of time. Uh, you know, Jeff, I, I don't know what you want to say about some of the OSS and prepackaged work. Uh, you know, it, it can be challenging for some of these applications uh, to get Istio to run yeah. there. And I think that there's opportunity for the Istio community to work with some of these other uh, open source communities to, to kind of provide package setups uh, of, hey, here is Istio with GitLab or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, I think for most of the third party tools where we're at right now is um, our basic idea is north south traffic we're going to protect. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to do the TLS, uh, UG TLS enforcement and all those, the good things we're, we've been talking about um, for third party applications. That's just how it's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, for simple third party applications, you know, east west, we can totally do um, MTLS, you know, within that namespace is, is totally reasonable. But something like GitLab, which is, it is no slide on GitLab. It's an incredible tool. It's just massive. Yep. <laughs> if you've seen, we, we deploy a lot of different GitLab uh, instances right now across multiple levels of classification and, and different environments. And it's, it's, it's just a very large um, home chart, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> um, and, and so it, there's just a bunch of stuff going on there. So trying to get MTLS enforcement across the, the mesh, you know, in, injecting sidecars for all those different workloads, it just doesn't work. There is so many... I mean, we could play whack-a-mole all day trying to get those to work, but it just it just doesn't. Um, then we have weird ones like Jitsi, uh, which is a VTC option. And I actually met with um, the creator of Jitsi and 8x8. Super helpful, very informative about the architecture and how they do it at scale for millions of users. It's all VM-based and orchestration, but it's it's not Kubernetes. And their their statement to me was, um, it just won't run in Kubernetes. Um, I understand why they said that now, because it was literally a nightmare. Um, and it's still not fully done. We were actually waiting on Istio 1.6 for a change that allowed us to do um, you know, association by, um, I think it was request URI for our um, sticky sessions, but, um, and when six is broken for us, we ended up doing 1.7, but yeah, just, we actually ended up leveraging some Istio stuff with Jitsi for North, South and East, West, but then only partially because Jitsi under the hood uses WebRTC and a lot of UDP traffic and the Envoy supports it, the Istio supports really not there. So we did this really complicated like orchestration of network load balancers and AWS, and then pass that through on host ports, a big mess. Um, yep. So definitely a mixed bag right now in the open source ecosystem. Yeah, uh, but on oh, maybe a little bit greener uh, pastures in the in the open source ecosystem, uh, auth services has been pretty great. Uh, y'all y'all have been able to to achieve quite a bit with it, uh, although still still some pain there, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we we're when we found that and settled on that technology, we knew it wasn't as supported. And we watched yeah. carefully the um, the folks who did the work to build it. I believe they were out of Pivotal originally, um, and, and now VMware. Um, and, and I actually intend to reach out to to some folks over on that side um, that we work with regularly to to kind of find a way to to get more involved there because um, I know that the, those three or four core contributors are not really focused on that right now. Um, so it is a little slower sometimes. You know, it's just typical open source pain. Um, yep. So we're platform one's offering to help now. So we're going to try to formalize it a little more just to, to find out you know, how we can lend our hand to keep it uh, running. And maybe down the road, we'll see it more integrated with this deal itself would be wonderful. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I would love to see that. Uh, awesome. And so with just, uh, uh, you know, some, we'll go very quick here because I know we are, we're all running short on time. Uh, if you're looking to do this yourself, I think, you know, maybe the two biggest things that, that we would say are uh, standardized as much as possible. Right, I think especially as we're getting the the 1.5 to 1.7 upgrade uh, kind of wrapped up, um, you know, having snowflakes, having different uh, special things, really cuts down on the speed at which uh, the entire organization can move when when you're an org as big as as uh, platform one and, and some of your DoD customers, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that the snowflake comment is huge for us, like. We can't afford to have pets and <laughs> we need cattle because yep, our stuff yep. has to be able to redeploy fast and come up and down over and over. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then, you know, by the same token, we, we want to think very carefully about what exactly is being exposed to developers and what the cognitive load there is. Right. I think Jeff did a wonderful, uh, you know, summary, a quick summary of, you know, kind of the iterations that they went through in getting to the, the, Hey, label your pod for SSO. Uh, that that they deliver today, right? Uh, and and a lot of that iteration was really kind of getting at finally, hey, what is the cognitive load that we really need to inflict on our developers for them to get the benefit, and how do we minimize that? Which is really just good API design, right? 
Uh, and the more you, you can spend some time to think through uh, what that needs to be ahead of kind of mass onboarding, I think the, the easier time you'll have with your overall mess, mesh adoption. Yeah, I just have one other thing there real quick. The um, beyond just like developers capacity to understand and to, to even worry about something cognitive load, as you, you mentioned, there's also the point of security and, and yep. focusing your efforts. So now we don't have 50 different ways of implementing SSO authentication. We have focused ways we're doing it and we're consolidating this down more and more. We still have depre deprecated and grandfather ways we're doing it right today that we're moving Always. over to this way over time. But, um, but the point being that we can focus our red team efforts now and our assessors and from a DOD perspective, accreditation is super important. You know, on other industries, this is important as well. For us, it's, um, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of bureaucracy behind this, but um, we have to have certain checks and, and things we have to do um, that now those questions that used to be every app team answering, you know, that five, six, seven questions about authentication and Aussie, auth in, RBAC, et cetera, we can now answer them for them at the platform level and the app developers can skip those things and focus on their core business versus this kind of context junk that that they could potentially mess up anyway and jeopardize their security footprint. Yep, and this really goes to the heart of what I believe is, is one of the most powerful benefits of the mesh, which is it allows these small central teams to, to create these big wins for the entire organization, right? Uh, the fact that, you know, who knows how, much, how many man hours you save just in, you know, how many engineering hours just in the, the security audit, right, that, that every individual program yep. has to go to at this point. Um, and so, you know, in that vein, uh, we actually, we really do believe that the service mesh is the, the, one of the best ways to, to start to enforce. And obviously, service mesh is part of the stack. Uh, but we believe that these methods really are the best way to, to start to ensure security across an organization. Uh, and so, uh, you know, one of the, in, you know, one of the benefits working with the government is we can work with, with organizations like NIST uh, to help publish around these standards, right? And so previously, uh, there had been this, this SP 800-204A, which laid out some basic security guidelines. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of the thing I'll close on is we actually have some, uh, another upcoming uh, SP that will have a, a call for comment on, uh, hopefully starting uh, in, in December, uh, that is really about this, this idea of the service mesh as an operational assurance framework, right? A way, you know, it will, will prov provide some guidance on how you can safely deploy a service mesh in a way that, that gives you these operational assurances. And we'll talk about, uh, and we'll talk about what those operational assurances are in detail. Uh, and then we'll talk about how you can then use those to deploy other systems like Auth and Auth Z and make the overall system more secure leveraging the service mesh, right? Uh, in that really kind of getting into the meta, how we use the service mesh to deploy, you know, even things that the mesh uses. Uh, and so we're, we're pretty excited about that because like we said, you know, we really do think that the, the mesh is, is key for, for security uh, moving forward. Um, and with that, uh, I think hopefully uh, on the day we'll, we'll take some questions. Jeff, anything you want to close with? Nope, we're excited. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, and yeah, good luck for, for folks who are looking forward to, to doing kind of similar, similar things with their own meshes.